Lord God, as you have moved in this service in many wonderful ways, please move a portion of your spirit into the words about to be spoken and heard, into that which will be thought and felt, so that in all ways we honor the living Christ in our midst. Amen. The Balancing Act, that's the name of this series. We've talked about how to keep in balance in a world that consistently tries to throw us off the, the tightrope of life. We talked about uh, dealing with cynicism a couple of weeks ago. Last week we talked about being authentic in our lives. Next week, uh, the bishop who wrote the book that is sort of the base of this, Bishop uh, Robert Schnazy, will be preaching all services. So uh, who better to preach than the one who wrote the book? And if you've not gotten that book that has 30 devotions in it written by the bishop, please do so. They're available in the Faith Formation table in the back or online as well. But I want to begin this sermon by relating a story that the bishop tells in the Balancing Act. The bishop, before he was a bishop, was a pastor of a church in Texas, and the operative word is Texas. This particular Texas church was about to have a sanctuary renovation, and in preparation of that for that, for some reason, the bishop got down on his hands and knees and looked under the pew, and he found something amazing under the pews. These are his words. Each pew beneath each seat width had a wire rack attached. There were hundreds of these in the sanctuary unseen by anyone for years. The racks were screwed closely to the wood surface under each and every seat. Imagine sitting in a pew, leaning forward, reaching between your knees up under your seat. That's what you'd need to do to touch one of the racks. Any idea what they were for? It took me a few minutes when I first saw them, and then I started to laugh. So think to yourself, Texas church, what were those racks for? Here is a hint. (laughs) Well, howdy, partner. (laughs) They were hat racks. In the 1930s, the cowboys from McAllen, Texas, or wherever his church was, would come in with their Sunday best, and then they needed a place to put them. They had those racks under the pews. Very efficient space work, don't you think? Now, since the 1930s, they had not ever been used. And do you think they're ever going to be used again? No, I don't think this is going to come back into fashion. I hope not. But I guarantee you, those racks are still there to this day and will always be. Because they're in church. Understand? Now, a business can't get away with that. Do you think a business would keep technology that was vogue in the 60s into the 2000s? It would be sort of laughable. If it did, it would be like you're a local business owner, and so you have to tally up receipts at the end of the day. Well, here you go. Look at this technology. You just, if this were, if we had an electrical outlet, you'd be hearing this. But you know... you people who might be a little older would remember the way this sounds, to tally up sales for the end of the day. What if you wanted to send a memo? Don't worry, you got this. Yes, siree. And you just type out your memo, take it to the mimeograph, let it swirl around a little bit, then you would have your copy that you could take manually to each person. Hey, what about making a phone call? (laughs) Young people, (laughs) this is a phone. This This is what they mean by dialing. You know, in case you wondered, what do you mean dial a phone? That's what they did, these older people out there. So can you imagine calling 
customers on this nowadays? Don't worry, you can do a conference call. Make, get another phone. <laughs> it's silly. It's laughable. And yet, really, the lesson is pretty, pretty clear. What things do we have lying around in our lives that have long since outlived their usefulness, but we keep having them around? We keep using them. What things do we do in our lives that have long since outlived their usefulness and maybe even are destructive now, and yet the lure of the past, because it worked in the past, we keep trying to do it in the present. And if you've ever had that inclination, the power of the past, and you know it's just not right, don't worry, you're in great company. Because even as someone as as illustrious as Moses was victimized by the power of tradition. In the story that Joy's just about to read to you, you're going to hear this. And it's an unusual story. It's a very striking story. And let me give you a setup for it. The children of Israel, led by Moses, have been wandering for several years in the wilderness, going toward the promised land. Years before, they had complained about no water. Well, now they are complaining again. They're very good at complaining. And listen to how this situation, this problem is resolved. But note especially what happens at the very end of the story. There's a twist. Our reading today is from Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13, from the New Revised Standard Version. The Israelites, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and against Aaron. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had died when our kindred died before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to bring us to this wretched place? It is no place for grain or figs or vine or pomegranate, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went away from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting. They fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aaron, and command the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Thus you shall bring water out of the rock for them. Thus you shall provide drink for the congregation, and their livestock. So Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he had commanded him. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Listen, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me to show my holiness before the eyes of the Israelites, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord and by which he showed his holiness. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Now, catch carefully what happened. The first time the people of Israel complained about no water, God commanded Moses to take his trusty staff and to hit the rock, just hit it, and water gushed forth. This time, God said, Moses, take your staff, stand before the rock, and command the water to come forth in the Lord's name. But Moses, with all of Israel looking at him, standing before the rock, had second thoughts. He knew that this worked in the past. Why, it would have to work right now. So he hit the rock once. 
and nothing happened. And he hit the rock again. And finally God said, well, he's going to keep hitting that rock, isn't he? So he let the water come forth out of the rock. But God was disappointed in Moses because Moses trusted the tradition of the past over God's promise in the present. Moses trusted more in the past than in what God was talking to him and how God was instructing him in the present. So the lesson is quite simple and the question is quite simple. Where in your life today are you continuing to use the walking stick of the past when God may be calling you to do something very new today? I just want to spend the next couple of minutes or so giving you some ideas about where you and I might be stuck in the past. How about in the area of our daily routine? If you are a smoker, odds are you started when you were a teenager. Because back then, smoking made you look cool and got you accepted by a certain crowd. But now that you're an adult, do you, are you still smoking? It's long outlived its usefulness, and yet you continue doing it. What other habits do you do that once were good, but now aren't? Or what about how you deal with people close to you on a daily basis? Is your daughter 14 and you treat her still like she was four, as she was in the past? Is your son 24 and do you treat him as if he's 14? Is your parent 80 and yet you keep treating him or her like your parent's 40? Get the idea? We live in the past and we drag it up with us and we can't hear the call of God as easily and as clearly today. Is God calling you to drop the walking stick in your daily routine? Or how about in your spiritual life? No matter how young or old you are, take a spiritual inventory. How have you grown in your faith? I found Christ when I was 15, had a very deeply emotional religious experience with him. He felt real to me, changed my life. But I cannot see Christ the same way. I cannot see God the same way. I cannot read the Bible the same way now that I'm just a few years older than back then. Because you have to ask yourself tough questions and you have to reflect and struggle and let your spiritual life grow every day. And if old habits are keeping you from it, develop new habits that enable you to ask yourself tough questions of the faith and grow. Is God calling you in your spiritual life to let go of that walking stick? How about in your expectations of church? We all have expectations of church, and I really hope that you found in this church, or if you're a member of another church, uh, in that church, a really good, close, knit community, and you feel the faith, and you feel alive. But remember this. Change happens even in church. Because church is about the only place I know where change is a four-letter word. <laughs> it has to be. A different pastor comes on board with a, preach, a different priority in preaching or style, or a new music director, or we change the order of worship, or the format of the bulletin, or we do things with the lighting and the shades and so forth. And most people, with any of the changes, go, ah! Not because necessarily you, it might be against your personal preference, it might be. But you see, in church, I believe that is the one place where people come and not expecting any change, because everything else is changing for you outside. So any change is met with resistance because church gives us security. You come in the same way. You know, you, you do those, some of the, the, the anthems the same way. You are used to the affirmation of faith the same way. And you change, we changed the Lord's Prayer once and I thought Armageddon had come. <laughs> Simply to give you a new way of, of, of praying. But you understand this, there has to be change in church 
because the Spirit of God is not residing in the, uh, the, the waters of Meribah back then with Moses. The Spirit of God rests with us right here at 1150 on January 17th, 2016. And the Spirit of God continually changes things to reach new people in new ways. Not using atom machines and typewriters and phones, but using the breath of the Holy Spirit to move lives, hearts. So we will continue doing new things to reach new people. And whenever you or I feel that resistance to that, know why change is happening in worship or in faith formation or in mission, and ask yourself, is God calling me to drop the walking stick? How about in the way we see Jesus? Hopefully, you feel Jesus' love and that you felt Jesus close to you. But know this, if you only look at Jesus through the lenses of the past, you will have a difficult time seeing what he is wanting you to do in the present. Because you have your stereotype of Jesus based in the past. You might see Jesus in terms of uh, someone who confronts you with really forgiving someone because this is what unconditional love means. It means forgiving someone before they even ask forgiveness. If you look at Jesus outside the lens of your past, you might see him as one who is shaking you up with your money. Where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. How are you being generous unto God? If you look at Jesus clearly through the lens of the present, he might be telling you to stand up in school, stand up at the workplace, stand up in your politics to, to reflect the ethics and the ethos of the kingdom of justice and righteousness. If you look at Jesus in the lens of the present, through the lens of the present, you might hear him talking to you about making connection with the marginalized of society, especially on Martin Luther King weekend, especially tomorrow. Or you might hear him talking to you about visiting the, the, those who are uh, confined in a nursing home or visiting those for whom the sidewalks are called their, their, uh, their homes. Get the idea. A vacation Bible school faith is great when you're a child. But if you have a VBS faith when you have your AARP card, that's not good. It might be that you have to let loose of the walking stick to grab hold of the hem of Jesus' garment to see him in a new way. So those are just some areas you see up there that you might want to consider. Is the past holding you back? It's very interesting that the conclusion of the story today has Moses being the one punished. The Israelites were the one complaining, and for pity's sake, Moses is the one who helped, although he disobeyed by tapping the stick on the rock, and consequently, he was not allowed to see the promised land. He was able to, to, uh, to go into the promised land. He was able to see it from another mountaintop, but was forbidden to go into it. Now, some folks might read that as a writer's interpretation, because Moses died before there. Who knows? But the point's clear. You cannot go into the promised land holding on to the walking stick of the past tradition. You learn from the past, but you are free to listen to the new thing God is telling you to do. For Jesus said, Behold, I make all things new. What new thing are you going to do today to be faithful to God's call to you today? It will be different for you than for me. We're all different. But the one thing we have in common, the one thing God is calling us to do, starts with this.